please lead the way, invite over your panel of guests, and, and uh, announce the topic. The panel, uh, as the panel is turning up, um, I, I can pick up from uh, General Flynn, who said that ISIS regarded the media as another province, another domain. If that indeed is true, we have much of the world uh, of television on this panel today to a remarkable extent. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Мы с Ритой коллеги, меня зовут Дмитрий Киселев, и я хочу Риточку поздравить с десятилетием компании RT. Рита, я тебя сердечно поздравляю. Поскольку компания молодая, то и розочки в маленьких бутончиках, как десятилетние девочки, на вырост. Вот говорят, что есть русская пропаганда и обычно ассоциируют с RT. Но если это и пропаганда, то это пропаганда здравого смысла. На самом деле, ну это, на самом деле в RT работает блестящая команда журналистов, которая занимается профессиональной деятельностью и ничем другим. А информационные войны ведут другие. Там киберкомандование под руководством четырехзвездных генералов, там войны Фейсбука и так далее. Это совершенно другая тема. Арти это чистая, здоровая компания, которая, я уверен, будет расти и предлагать миру массу альтернативных мнений и быть площадкой для рефлексии, для того, чтобы задуматься, что с нами происходит сейчас и куда же мы рулим в будущее. Ритма поздравляет, делает прекрасную благородную работу. Спасибо, Дим, спасибо, что заехал. Тебе тоже удачи. Спасибо тебе. Sorry for the interruption. Back to you. Thank you very much. The interruption was all in a good cause. You've already been introduced to Margarita Simonian, editor in chief of RT. To my left, we had the uh, deputy uh, uh, deputy director of the CCTV news channel in China, um, Ms. Liu Gu. And to, to, to my right is an amazing character from India, and uh, truly amazing, the most watched man on Indian television, so it is said, uh, but uh, Arnab Goswami, but he's also, also uh, in charge, uh, president and editor-in-chief of the Times uh, channel in India. I'm looking forward to hearing from the subcontinent. Then we have Anna Williams, who's uh, head of BBC World News. And on the right, all the way, uh, for the moment, from Lagos, uh, we have Nigel Parsons, chief executive of TVC News. I want to pick up immediately, though, from the, the numbers we've just heard, and indeed Margarita. Uh, does those numbers surprise you? Uh, do they encapsulate what is happening out there through the 10 years of your journey of RT. Thank you, and thank you all for your interest in our conference and for participating and for listening. No, the numbers do not surprise me, and actually I was surprised to see one of the quotes. It was a quote um, from, from some Russian respondent that said that I don't know uh, why should I watch TV news anymore because when I watch TV news, the items had been picked up for me by some editor. Why should I do that if I can pick what I want to read and what I want to see myself using the internet? I was very surprised to see that quote because that is exactly word by word, something that I has, have said for at least five years now, whenever asked on the future of news, the future of television, the future of internet news. Uh, that's exactly what I always thought, that people are going to uh, use more and more and more of internet news because they don't want somebody else's agenda to be, uh, uh, to be more prevalent than what they can choose themselves. But we'll get on to the future later, but just to finish that bit of your conversation, you see television driving the interest online, not the other way around, that television is still the center, the major push forward. We'll see how it goes. 
That is For very some reason, I think it will change. We will, we will explore your <laughs> cautious... Price Waterhouse Coopers agrees, I see. <laughs> we, we will explore your cautious answer later. Okay. Ms. Yi. China? What do you think of those numbers? Is it your experience? How, what does the Chinese research show about the audience, how it's changing, what's important to it? Uh, actually, I think that number is quite encouraging. And uh, actually, to be honest, uh, we are a little bit afraid of the digital media age now because we have experienced a lot of pressure from the digital media, especially in China. Uh, we have done a certain kind of research uh, recently, and it shows that uh, less and less young people, I mean, young generation, uh, watch TV, and uh, especially TV news. But I, I, this, this number just showed us that uh, basically uh, it's, it depends on, uh, it's no matter uh, what kind of way people watch those news, people still show interest in of the content of those news. So cross-border uh, broadcasters like uh, what we have present here is, uh, I think, still got future because uh, um, we can still pr provide a lot of information and uh, which can attract uh, even to those younger generation. And also this uh, number shows a kind of uh, demand. And also I believe this is why uh, CCTV News start to its um, operation. And uh, we would like to set up a certain kind of platform to communicate, to exchange, and to uh, especially to promote the understanding between different cultures so that uh, we can make people uh, understand with each other. You know, this morning, we, the whole atmosphere here is, is heating up by the talks uh, of the relationship between Russia and the US. People mention a lot about the understanding between each other. So I think the important role for cross-border broadcaster like uh, RT and CTV News probably uh, is to just uh, set up such kind of bridge to let more people to communicate and let more people to understand with each other. And from your perspective, uh, does it actually, and your research, does it actually matter which platform people use? Or is the important thing that they are interested in news of an international nature? For me, uh, I don't think that's a really big issue. Uh, I think it's still the content, the, the information, the news, uh, you provide is uh, matters the most. From the Indian perspective, Anna, mostly he's, uh, he's taking a day off from investigating <laughs> scandals in, English, uh, in Indian society <clears throat> and exposing corruption to the entire subcontinent. Well, but, uh, but apply your brain, sir, to, to these sort of questions. For, now now for that you've, uh, you've portrayed me as some kind of journalistic Robin Hood, <laughs> <laughs> I liked Sam's presentation incredibly. To summarize it, it tells me about the past, the present, and the future. Let me begin by saying that the hegemony of Western media has to end. Western media has had it too good for too long, and it has ruined the balance of power that's required, not just in politics and society. I was told but in you media were a well. shy and retiring <clears throat> journalist. <laughs> now, since Sam started with numbers, I'd like to share some numbers. Sam's numbers were very interesting. If you look at his numbers, he says that in India, 91% of Indians follow cross-border news. So Indians are most interested about the world. The least interested in the world are the Americans and the British. Only 44 to 46% of people follow cross-border news. But US and UK together contribute 74% of the source of global news, whereas all of Asia contributes 3%. If I were to summarize that in one line, it basically says that Indians are the least insular people, most open-minded. Americans are the most insular people, right? But they have complete dominance over the global narrative in terms of news. I share a couple of other numbers with that. I have said recently that India will be the next media capital of the world. And I want to share with this audience why I think so. We have 99,000 publications in India. We have 13,761 registered newspapers in India. We have 404 news channels in India which run 24-7 and we don't have one single global news network. Now if I look at Sam's figures and the figures that I'm presenting to you and begin with an assumption and I'll wrap up, begin with an assumption that there is a, there is a problem in the world in terms of balance. 
It is from countries like India, which speak English, which are democracies, where the challenge to the global news hegemony is about to come. And I just think it's so necessary from a balancing of power perspective, the Americans are very concerned about the entry of Russia into the Middle East. They are more concerned that they are going to lose their balance rather than establishing a new balance. Similarly, in the world of media as well, the time has come to, pro to provide a serious counter to global media sources like BBC and CNN, which have been hegemonistic for far too long. <laughs> you in a, in, a, in, a few more, in a few more moments, you will be every bit as popular in Moscow as you clearly are in Delhi. But you use the big words like hegemony. Right, here's your manifesto. This moment, this day, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? You, you've given, you've given okay. numbers of, that talk of I will... balance <coughs> and hegemony. Yeah. India is a huge, prosperous, rich country. What are you going to do about it? I don't know how prosperous and rich we are, but we are going to be prosperous and rich. But I'll share some <laughs> statistics with you. Look at the potential of a country like India. Today, we have 100 million mobile phones in India. Three years from now, we'll have 500 million and mobile phones in with India. With respect, that was not my question. Okay. You, say, you say the gap is in India's international reach yes. and, and the insularity of, of, of the UK and the <clears> US. <throat> what are you, as an Indian media executive, going to do to redress the international balance, if at all? The first thing that I would do would be to remind the Americans of what they have done in the last 20 years in the world. As the Chinese Premier Zhao Enlai said about the Americans, one of the delightful things about Americans is they have absolutely no historical memory. They don't remember. <clears throat> or Gore Vidal said that the USA is the United States of amnesia. The fact of the matter is that you must remember today. And I'll only ask one question to this audience. It is 12 years to the day that a theory of the weapons of mass destruction was fed and if I may say so, amplified by the Western media, everyone bought into it. They were cheerleaders. Nobody seriously questioned it. At one point of time, there was an article in the Newsweek magazine which said it doesn't matter if Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, but the fact is they shouldn't get any. So what I'm going to do in a very succinct reply to your question is to restore the balance by creating a global media environment that is not located out of Washington, New York, or London. You create that global capital, you'll have a balance of power. Ten years back, you would have never imagined that India would be the software capital of the world. Today, we are the software capital of the world, and I think that's where we are headed. Right. I, I, <coughs> I, I think you've set out your stall extraordinarily well. I will return to some of the details of it later. Um, Anna, Anna, Anna Williams, you're, you're the representative of the BBC hegemony. <laughs> inflicting, in, inflicting your views on the world. Come on, woman, defend yourself, and also tell us a bit. Uh, uh, and also tell us a bit about your reaction to the research in a slightly more serious manner. So, well, I suppose on the hegemony argument, I would say that actually we broadcast in 30 different languages, so that actually we, we cannot just have a single homogenous view. We cannot simply be like that because we are so multidimensional and multi-ethnic and multi national and where we come from and how we report and where we're Could based you move the from. microphone a little bit closer to you? Thank you. Um, so that would be my, my response to the hegemony argument. I think the other bit, you know, the, the report was really um, interesting from PwC. I think it reflects, again, the sort of, we have quite a lot of these reports, which all more or less kind of give you the same trends. I think um, BBC World News did its own poll recently. And again, you know, two-thirds of the respondents want to know what's going on in the world. Two-thirds of the respondents are concerned about world events. You know, the global news is more relevant than ever before to, to our audiences. I think the only thing I, I thought was interesting, one thing I picked up on, is you talked about the, um, the people being young, urban, and affluent. And actually, I would correct that to say that they're young, urban, and aspirational. And I think that's a sort of a really big distinction, and that people want to take part in the world, play a role in the world, and understand what happens across the world. And that's our challenge to do that. I mean, we all hear about the phrases, the butterfly flaps his wings, or you've got your chaos theory, or cause and effect. But that is essentially what we need to do every day, is explain what, in an impartial, accurate way, what the news is, give the information, provide the variety of opinions, and viewpoints, but let people make up their own minds around that. You know, we're not here to sort of say, this is a viewpoint, you must follow this. But I also think we have to remember our audiences and try to make the news 
relevant to them wherever they are. So, you know, if you're, are you going to tell an audience in America exactly this, you know, spin the news in exactly the same way as you would for India? And I know it's not even about spinning, but I think it's also about remembering where you're broadcasting to and trying to make it relevant. And Nigel Parsons has a very simple task. He just has to speak on behalf of the entire continent of Africa. Please, please do so now, sir. Um, yeah, I haven't got any pie charts or statistics to back up anything I'm going to say, but I actually fundamentally disagree with a lot I've heard here today. Well, actually, in, in many ways, the world is going backwards. Um, I was interested to hear Ken Livingston talk about how he can't go to northern Nigeria anymore, uh, nor can I, um, even though I run the first pan-African channel and it's based in Nigeria. I can't go there. I'm the only non-African there, by the way. Um, it's simply too dangerous. I mean, 40 years ago, I rode a horse across Afghanistan. You can't do that anymore. And when it comes to news, I don't think the world has really gone hugely forwards. I think it's very important that we have all these new channels, international channels. But by and large, I still believe that news ripples outwards. I still believe that most people in this room are far more... Uh, interested in the grisly murder that happened two doors down the road uh, than a church that got bombed in Kano in northern Nigeria. I just think it's the way it goes. People, you know, news goes outwards. You're far more interested in things that affect you personally. Um, having said that, I think the more news channels we have, um, the better. And there are, yes, I would agree with Sam, a lot of people who are hopping channels just to get a different perspective. But ultimately, we tend to look at things through our own um, pair of rose-tinted glasses. We all have our own perspectives. That's why, for me personally, you know, to get any idea what's going on in the news, I need to listen to an RT, a CCTV, a CNN, and a BBC. And the truth will be somewhere in between all those because no one's got a monopoly on it. And that's precisely you know, what's behind um, a new channel I've launched, which is uh, TVC. It's the first pan-African channel. Our tagline is through African eyes, because Africans, for the first time, want to see the world from their perspective. They don't want to see it from CCTVs, Al Jazeera, or CNN African eyes, which we would call kind of South African eyes. So you're very close to Arnab in your, in, your, in, your, in your approach, actually. Certainly closer, and I don't believe in all this hegemony stuff. I can watch NDTV and TV Today in London. There's plenty of Indian stuff around. There's endless Punjabi channels and Hindi channels. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't buy that argument at all. And you don't, by definition, um, buy the argument of the distinguished BBC correspondent, uh, John Simpson, who, uh, who, 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 said, who said that... Um, that the British media, and by, and by extension the Western media, was grotesquely selective in their view of news. You think people are just interested mostly in what's happening around the corner? I don't think... I mean, the idea of a kind of global media capital is kind of terrifying to me in terms of, of uh, monopoly of information. I, I, I do think, honestly and truly, that, I mean... If you look at BBC World compared to BBC Domestic Channel, they're quite a different agenda. They're playing to a different audience. Um, we want to know about our taxes going up far more than, you know, things that are happening, maybe a flood in China. Um, that's just the way the world is. But you don't want... You're not aspirational that the world should be different? You say the, that is how the world is. It might be how the world is now, but is there something more idealistic to look forward to? I'm, I'm, more I'm, share, more I'm, sharing, I'm certainly not values? aspirational for you know, everyone to be the same, wear the same clothes, eat the same food, have the same views, and all the same information. It sounds like a nightmare to me. You know, I say vive la différence, and I love going to exotic places um, because they are exotic and different. Margarita, what has changed in the last uh, 10 years in terms of, clearly you have established yourself, clearly you have, you have had a considerable degree of success, but what has changed in terms of perspective? Do we see international news in a different way than 10 years ago? Yes, I um, do think so. And the numbers that our friend here from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, kindly gave us um, actually say the same thing. What they're saying, if I remember that correctly, that 10 years ago, uh, on average, a person would use two sources of information to get the news from, and now it's more than four. Now, why is it so? 
well, first of all, because more new sources have been established. But also, I think, so I might be wrong, but uh, my feeling is that that's because uh, people m realize more and more that there is much more to be said about the world than their traditional sources of information are telling them. People are realizing that other sources might, that are available to them, might tell them stories that they find fascinating, interesting, important, and completely different to what they had been used to hearing from their traditional sources. And that is the main change that we are seeing right now in the world of information. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 indeed it is. Louis, do you, do you feel the same? Um, do you feel the same about this, that something important has changed because of the existence of these channels? Definitely, definitely. I think that the most important thing that has changed is this, this feeling and the amount of people that, that find themselves thinking, and that amount of people is growing day by day in the world, thinking that, well, this might not be the whole truth. Let me check some other source to find some other side of the story. I think that 10 years ago, uh, not so many people actually ever thought of that, 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 that mere thought that this might not be the whole truth did not occur to a lot of people because they were so used to their traditional media sources and the traditional media sources were so trusted that it wouldn't even occur to a large portion of the audience that, wait, 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 what did they say about Serbia? Well, maybe there's something more about Serbia and maybe there's an alternative view that I should know before I form my opinion. This is the main thing that has changed. What is your perspective, Lou, from CCTV? Do you, do you see that something important is changing out there in the behavior and attitudes of viewers and you are, and you are part of that change? Uh, actually, I still want to go back to the demands why people were so interested in this cross-border news. I think one concept is the globalization. I think probably 10 years or 15 years ago, uh, globalization is not that uh, big issue in people's daily life. But now, I think globalization is linking everybody uh, together, like uh, we talk about the economy, the development economy. Uh, I still remember that when I was in the university, when I started to learn the journalism, people still talking, yeah, U.S. people just take care, just to think about uh, domestic thing. They are not so care about the international thing. I don't know, uh, but so far, I don't think that U.S. people or any people in the world can still hold such kind of concept before, because if you don't take care of the, the others, the global event happened in the other country, it may just... Uh, affect your daily life, like the oil price, if there is a kind of a war in the Middle East, um, the oil price may just be falling, and if the kind of policy change in the uh, certain countries, I mean in the Europe, the kind of immigration policy change, it may affect uh, different countries, different peoples. So I think this is uh, quite different, and this is basically, I think, the root of people, why so many people now are interested in uh, the international yes. news than okay. 10 years ago. Anna, uh, Nigel's concerned that as against a backdrop of globalization, you'll get homogenous, globalized news, that that's a danger, and it will be boring news. Is there, is there, is there a danger that, you, that, that your vision of the world might lead in that direction? It depends entirely on what you call boring. I find asymmetrical news boring. I find news that emanates only from certain world parts of the world boring. Now, so you Nigel may you agree with John Simpson. Yeah. There's a no, grotesque yeah. uh, selectiveness. I do, and I would like to substantiate it with three particular examples. We can go at the 80s when Ronald Reagan described the Mujahideen as, you know, Rambo-type people who were simply fighting with handheld weapons against a foreign invader. And when he met the Mujahideen, and that was covered, and that is where the ISIS story goes back to. Have people actually looked back and connected the dots? They haven't. The point is, look at the Paris attacks and let's look at the coverage of the Paris attacks to answer your question. Yes. Here we are, the Paris attacks have generated a lot of global coverage up to the point where we have talked this morning about a global coalition to fight ISIS and why it cannot happen. You would know that on the 26th of November 2008, 
In the Mumbai attacks, 165 Indians were killed in four locations. In the Paris attacks, it was one by 10 terrorists sent from Pakistan. And that was the greatest act of bloodshed which happened. I saw that, that was covered, about, that was covered no, extensively no, all around no, the world. No, once, it was. They, once, they weren't. Its coverage is also, you've got to look at coverage in terms of whether you cover or you cover with the intensity, passion, and for the length of time that you cover the Paris attacks. You see, we must be open in this forum. The point that I'm making is the Paris attacks generated universal outrage they should have done. And the scale of the attack has now prompted what is close to an international effort against ISIS. Before the ISIS, before there was Paris, when Mumbai was attacked, there weren't as many news outlets in the US or the UK who took up the job, and I'm not talking about coverage, of sanctions against Pakistan. And the reason for that is because the US has been hand in glove with what is happening in Pakistan. I find it very surprising, and maybe people in this audience know, don't know about this particular story. If I were to tell you that the person who carried out the surveillance was one of the masterminds of the attacks in Mumbai, was an American citizen by the name of David Coleman Headley, who was not just an American citizen, he was an FBI double agent. An FBI double agent was the mastermind of the Mumbai attacks. He went over to the dark side, and he was a double agent for both the lashkar e toiba as well as... Just a minute. No, no, no. no, no let's, let's, just, let's, allow I, me to complete my no, point. I, I will let you put like no, point, but to, I want just to put in that we cannot deal with in great detail with historic no, no, I'm just conspiracy taking, theories I'm just, on this platform. No, no, but it's continue. not a conspiracy yeah. theory. It's a very relevant point. I find it very surprising that only one American investigative journalistic portal called ProPublica did the story of David Coleman Headley. And the reason I'm highlighting it is, please consider, if today it was proven that there was a similar person responsible for the Paris attacks, what kind of coverage would that have got, as opposed to the coverage that this story got? Now, we can say, how many American news outlets and British outlets have said, how can you get into a plea bargain with this particular individual? The point I'm making is one simple point. There is, I wouldn't say bias or prejudice, but there has been an asymmetry, which perhaps, and I would give the benefit of doubt, stems from the locational prejudices that come in, that when things happen, when they are closer to you, you report it you know, in, in greater depth. When they happen away from you, you do report it, but not with the same intensity and passion. And I think that is one of the reasons today we need a balance of powers in the media world. Are we not confusing two things, domestic news services and international news services no. represented here today. Surely the asymmetry is not the same. There's a problem with domestic news services, I agree, but that is not no, what we're no, here to discuss no, today. No, I'm Surely talking about, I'm to, to, to clarify, I am talking about global news sources. I'm not talking about yeah. CNN domestic or BBC domestic. Okay. I'm talking about their global coverage and I find a gap between the way, way they covered Mumbai and the way they covered Paris. Okay, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, Anna, you've, you've already addressed the problem, but maybe it just, a greater length, does that, does that view chime with your daily working experience? My view. Yeah. Uh, so I would say I remember Mumbai incredibly well. It was sort of seven years ago, and in fact we marked the anniversary of it again this year, just when it, it um, uh, you know, just recently. But I remember the non-stop coverage we had on BBC World News, yeah. and I remember we, the, the people we sent out to cover it, I remember all those editorial dilemmas that we also went through because of the voices that came through from the people were calling from the hotel rooms, what do you report, what do you not report, the safety of those concerns. And I remember the safety of our teams there, and I remember not sleeping and being at work constantly over the, the number of days that it took. Because unlike Paris, it, it ran. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't over in a sort of an hour and a half in the sense of, of the, how the siege went on. But, um, and we obviously covered it quite extensively before then, the train, um, the attacks on the train station. But I do think it is there, you know, there's also obviously, I think, I think the other issue sometimes is an event in Mumbai, an event in Paris, they're taking place in a major capital city where, or New York or London or Madrid, 
where they're unfolding in front of your eyes. I think the ones that are so much harder are the events in Kano, the events in, you know, where- Where no know, journalists what, are safe. Where no journalists are safe, where no one is there, the ones you can't get to, that you know an atrocity is unfolding, but you cannot operate freely in those areas. You can't get to it. And they're the challenges I think we all face. And how do we do, how do, yeah. we do that? And I know, you know, Ni you know sort of certainly Nigeria is, is one of those major ones that we look at all the time and we struggle with. Anna, could you lead us in a slightly different direction, but one that flows directly out of the conversations this morning, the implication that the media and the international media are important and playing, could play an increasingly important role in matters of war and peace and informing people better. Do you, as a journalist, an editor, an executive, feel any responsibility for higher issues of war and peace or are you just getting the, the, the goddamn story out there i think you know for me the sort of mission is to inform to gather information to inform and in an impartial um as way as possible but to gather the information and to put it out there and you know hopefully by the fact of whether you're sitting in you know, some are in Downing Street, or, or you're sitting in Delhi, or you're sitting in, in, in China, wherever you are, that you're, whether you're both a politician and member of the military, or just a concerned citizen, that actually the fact that you have that information and that that is available to you in some way, hopefully, influences events on the ground. So in the end, nobody wants to continue to see human suffering. Margarita, do you feel, as a journalist and an executive, any special responsibility beyond just covering the widest range of stories you think is relevant? The implication from, you know, from the general and the previous conversation is that the media has an important role to play and should play it better and more seriously. Absolutely. I absolutely do. And actually, I um, sometimes wonder, um, do the journalists whose work was mentioned today by my Indian colleague, the, you called them cheerleaders, didn't you? Do the journalists who cheered for Iraq war and whose work partially actually did lead to Iraq war, do they feel sorry? Do did they, many, have, do did they have... Did many journalists actually cheerleaders or just, re, or just reporting the politicians in their society? Question mark? No, there were quite a lot of articles and, and quite a lot of pieces on the air that okay. were cheerleading, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If it's a short one. It's a very short one. The point she's making, and I agree with her, that the genuine belief is that it is only in a very diversified you know, media space that you can have a very serious discussion of the causes and the climate that has led to the situation in the Middle East today. And hence, if we are to truly examine what are the one of the factors, because domestic public opinion matters everywhere in the exactly. world. If there was domestic public opinion, since we cannot separate with respect what domestic channels do from what global channels do, because if the domestic channel is building up a certain sentiment in favor of a war, then inevitably there is less pressure on the government. Hence, we must examine whether the domestic channels also are asking the questions in as forthright a way. And if they don't, then one alternative is for channels like Russia today. Other channels, channels emerging from elsewhere in the world to broadcast right into the USA so that people there get a different perspective. That's exactly what we're doing. And if you let me continue, I often wonder whether those journalists feel responsibility, whether they are sorry, whether they have nightmares, whether they uh, do realize that their work contributed to a lot of people dying. And Every day I question myself and I make myself think, what if what we are doing might lead to more bloodshed? We have to be very, very careful in what we are doing. Um, we, do, we are not broadcast in Russian, so domestic audiences in Russia do not watch us. We, we are not in Russian. Would it be a good idea if your view of an external world was broadcast in Russian? There's a, lot the of, there, there's a lot of channels in Russia that, okay. in Russian and in Russia that broadcast similar But you have views. a particular perspective. But what, what I wanted to say is I can't even imagine what huge burden of responsibility editors-in-chief and, and um, journalists who work for the Russian TV stations feel because it's so difficult. For instance, this situation with Turkey right now, Turkey and Russia, 
Can you imagine how difficult it is not to let your emotions, not to let this initial, oh my God, Turkey, let's go bomb them, not to let it go on the air, not to let it inspire people, not to let it encourage people, and not to let it encourage people as much as they start to demand exactly the same from the government. Exactly that. Okay. It's, it's a very good question, and we feel that every day, and I think every journalist should, should think about it every day, it's like doctors. You, you shouldn't do harm. Uh, Nigel, your, your view of that? Do, do journalists have a special responsibility or only the responsibility to report things in as even-handed a manner um, as they No, they have, a huge, they have a huge responsibility, but again, I think we've actually um, gone backwards um, rather than forwards. And I think, you know, more and more babble, more and more footage, faster, quicker, more and more... I'm not sure how much is helping, and I'll go back uh, to the Vietnam War, which was the first one I went to, although well, I only made a week um, before it ended. I'm not that old, nearly. Um, but the, the Vietnam War, you know, the media played a huge role in galvanizing public opinion against that deeply unpopular war and brought it to an early close. In Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, and I was in Libya when NATO decided to start bombing, um, working there, um, not as a journalist, but actually um, rebuilding a TV station. I mean, I watched the, the, the reporters in those conflicts, and they were cheering it on, whether it was Al Jazeera cheering on the Muslim Brotherhood or Channel 4 cheering on the so-called Arab Spring, which turned into a bleak midwinter, as far as I can see. I mean, you know, they're very quick, and they're still using the word Arab Spring. What Arab Spring? You know, we were better with Gaddafi, Assad, and Saddam, in my view. We knew, we knew where they were, they were controlled, and the world is a happier place. So I don't think... You know, these recent conflicts, we've done a great job. No. And, and the people of those countries were safer and happier, actually, if you compare it to what is going on right now. I agree. As I said, I was in Libya. Uh, Libya, when Gaddafi came to power, I'm not a fan of Gaddafi, don't get me wrong. However, Libya had huge illiteracy, no public health, uh, you know, huge unemployment. When I, when I was there, when NATO started bombing, there was 100% literacy, free education, free public health, and it was safe, safe as houses. Unless you were foolish yeah. enough to stand up and criticize the government, of course. Yeah. You didn't do that. Yeah, so, so you know, if I may just... Of course. Uh, you know, so if we, the British and American governments, they fed this narrative to their media. Why do you keep banging on about British and American governments? Because they have the hegemony of uh, global media coverage <laughs> as of today. I think we've been down that road no, already. No, no, we, we're talking about a conflict okay. which started in a certain historical context. Yeah. So we need to look back and say, if we don't want to repeat the context, the relevant question today is, yes. would a more multipolar perspective of what happened in 2003, 2004 have led to a different set of consequences today? Rather, as, as many people in this audience in the morning and I was watching, were lamenting the kind of military intervention that's going on in the Middle East. I'm sure the peoples, either of Russia or of the USA, don't want their governments involved in the Middle East. But what was that a consequence of? It was the consequence of a very believing, a very indulgent media, which... As well, Nigel, again, I, I, don't, I say, absolutely disagree. I mean, certainly, as far as the UK was concerned, nearly two and a half million people marched through the streets of London saying, not in my name. They were informed enough to decide they didn't want that war. It was the politicians who let us down, not the media in that case. Where I do disagree is that once the war started, they all kind of got behind our boys. But in the run-up... The media was not in favor. I want Nigel. Can I just one yes, okay, quickly. You see, an analysis was done, Nigel. It depends on which way you look at it. Analysis was done of the New York Times, where they said 90% of the heavy breathing headlines on the front page were for the war, and articles that were against it were. I was talking about the UK, not the New York Times. Yeah. So I'm, I'm focusing on what was happening in the UK because that was the dominant. <laughs> okay, look, you made the point. I want, uh, I want to, I want to exploit uh, Nigel's appearance here to represent a voice that is not represented on this panel, Al Jazeera. You, uh, in, a prior, in a previous life, you set up Al Jazeera English. What do you think uh, that channel impact has had on informing events in the Middle East? And is it doing as well now as it did at the outset when you were in charge? Well, I think it's a very important voice. I still think the Arabic channel is far more influential in the Middle East itself. Um, and certainly when we were setting up Al Jazeera English, there were a lot of concerns from the Arabic side that we were going to water down uh, their very much kind of pro-Arab 
um, Intifada sort of message. Um, Al Jazeera made his name on the second Intifada, of course. Um, I think the English Channel started out uh, maybe a bit dull, but very, 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 very balanced. Uh, since they've taken on um, Arabic management, they've become far more radical. Uh, have openly supported the Muslim Brotherhood in places like Egypt, uh, uh, you know, take a very soft line on ISIS. Is that a mistake, so in, your, is that a mistake in your view? Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, it's their toy. They can do what they like with it. It's not my money. Um, but, I, you know, what I do think is that if you're going to watch an Al Jazeera, you know, you also need to watch an RT and a BBC because, uh, as I said earlier, the truth is somewhere in between. Everyone's got their own perspective and they're quite entitled to their own perspective. Uh, you, I want to change slightly to ask you, ask you perhaps the most difficult question of all. To what extent do you feel your channel, and indeed the other channels, are part of soft power, as, it, as it's called? And does it matter who pays, ultimately, for your editorial content? Or do you have a sufficiently strong news culture to stand out against the wishes of politicians? Actually, this is a really difficult question. But, uh... Deliberately so. <laughs> but I, I still think that um, as a uh, news organization, journalism and uh, professionalism to, to do a kind of um, uh, balanced objective uh, news is the most important thing. Um, of course, I think as a state broadcaster, we uh, kind of have a kind of responsibility to just uh, give an uh, image of the whole country. Yeah, definitely. Yes, and, it would, and, it's, right. and it would not be a terribly surprising thing if you if you represented some of the values of that culture. Yes, I I think definitely. Uh, this is also why I think um, uh, we uh, we think it's uh, important to have such kind of a channel is to just uh, let promote um, different culture and different kind of value and make more people to understand with each other. So that's why I think it's also important for CCTV News to just to represent uh, the, the value, the, the culture and the way of doing things of China. Margarita, are you part of the soft power of the Russian Federation? We are part of the soft power of the Russian people, that's for sure. You know, I will answer uh, maybe a little philosophically. Last time I checked, and correct me if I'm wrong or if, had, if it has changed since, the BBC website in their section where they um, uh, were um, explaining what the BBC World News is for, it Don't did. Worry, I was going to ask yeah, it did have a line. No, no, no. It did. It, it did to. have a line that I really liked, and I want to quote it because it's uh, it's very similar to us. Also, it did have a line that said that the part of the mission of the channel is to promote or bring British values to the world, which I found. Um, a very short way of saying what channels like ours are actually doing. What they are doing is they are trying to bring the values of the countries they are established in to the world. They are trying to show the world what we think about the world. And they are trying to make sure that the world is not let without this point of view. Okay. Like Nigel said, if you watch Al Jazeera, you should also watch RT, also watch BBC. If you watch the BBC, you should also watch Al Jazeera, CCTV, and so on and so forth. You really need to get this diff different point of view. It would be very naive to say that any of them is objective. Even the BBC, I'm sorry. The, as, I mean, as much as the BBC always says that they're trying, it's still, it doesn't really matter whether it's funded by the government or from a license fee or from foreign ministry like it used to be the case. Um, it, it's still run by journalists who were brought up in certain ways, with certain values, with certain views of the world, who have certain understandings of what is going on. And no matter what you do, no matter how objective you try to stay, this view of the world is reflected in your reports. You know, in one country, a journalist might sincerely believe that to be gay should be punished uh, by death. In another country, a journalist should sincerely believe that uh, uh, gays should be allowed to get married and have children and so on and so forth. 
And these views, I'm, I'm talking about gays now, uh, deliberately not to go into politics. Yeah. Understood. Understood. These views are reflected in what you're saying, in what you're covering, whether you like it or not. Okay. And, and first of all, just do you accept um, the accuracy of, of Margarita's description of the BBC mission. Is that a reasonable, uh, a reasonable statement of it first? Uh, no. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure kind of exactly where it came from, but I think the BBC is, is quite a, you know, it's, it's got, it's sort of multifaceted. What, what is it, what is it then? I think it's, its mission is to provide impartial, accurate... Okay, because that's what it's, that, that's what its mission... That's what its mission is, and that's what my job is when I walk in the building every day of the week, is to provide impartial, independent, and accurate news. Uh, can, now, we ha can, we have the can we have the heckling in, form, in the form of intelligent questions, which I will allow you to put after the speakers are finished? But, you know, so I, I think, but, but the BBC is also, it, you know, it's got many different facets. I don't, you know, represent all of it, I, I'm, you know, but it's got obviously a domestic aspect. It's got a um, world service aspect, and it's also got a commercial BBC World News and dot .com aspect. But frankly, whether we're, who funds us is irrelevant when you walk in the door and you sit down and you do your job every day. I've got 40 different nationalities working for me. I think that is the most important thing I can do, is to make certain that we have so many different people from so many different nationalities, so that we don't, so we get okay. as many viewpoints, whether okay. it is, whether you come yes. from a country that punishes gays or doesn't punish gays based yes. on their being married. Okay. Just, just for, for this audience who may not, indeed, why should they follow the ins and outs of British funding of broadcasting? Uh, for, about, for a million years, the World Service was funded directly by the British Foreign Office. Then, just to get some public spending off the balance sheet, it was suddenly transferred in a late-night session, uh, so that it was paid for by the licence fee payers. Uh, BBC, under financial pressure, suddenly the government, in the form of money coming out of the defence budget, um, is now paying, uh, paying for some new services for, for the World Service. Leaving aside, uh, leaving aside the issues of strict accuracy and impartiality, does that give you a perception problem or not? I don't think so. Uh, I don't believe it does. Obviously, hecklers in the audience may feel differently, but um, I, you know, I think that its reputation stands for itself. And I think it doesn't, you know, I don't believe it does because actually, I think bizarrely, you know, you had a period w w within the UK where it was somehow felt that because BBC World News was commercial, that somehow that made us less pure than those who were funded by the licence fee. Or there was that big, great debate when the, the BBC.com internationally put ads on the website. Did that suddenly risk our independence? Did that... And, and, you just think, well, what difference does it make whether you've got an ad on your website or you don't have an ad on your website? The, the issue is not where your funding comes from. The issue is what you're actually aiming to do every day. Nigel, you're manifestly British, uh, so therefore kind of possibly be uh, unbiased, but you're a sort of independent arbitrator. You work, you work for Al Jazeera. I'm obviously not British, by, for the record as well. <laughs> now, you're, we're both Irish, though I'm, I'm of the UK variety, and she's, she's the Republic of Ireland. So there's a little extra layer of complexity on our panel. Act as a sort of arbitrator from your Al Jazeera hat and your African hat. Do you think, the, uh, do you think impartiality and objectivity is even possible? An aspiration, yes, but is it possible in reality? Doesn't it, isn't everything culture-laden in the end? It kind of very much depends on the, the, the program. I mean, if, if it's a breaking news story, you know, the journalist's job is simply to report the facts as they know them. There are other programmes, though, that um, I think are perfectly entitled to put forward, um, you know, different points of view and perspectives, because I'm sure there is as many opinions in this room as there are people, um, and you can't eliminate that. Um, well, you know, God forbid that we do, that we all end up with, you know, the same android brain and microchip. Um, and so I think, yes, if it's a purely factual event, a car crash, uh, I don't know, something like that, a building collapse, yes, you can actually just stick to the facts. But if there's anything else where it gets emotive, you are going to get opinions and perspectives creeping in. Right, I would like to do something uh, slightly unusual. I would like to take a few questions now. We will return to the panel rather than just leaving you lot uh, to the very end and you might follow. But I really, really will be very tough on people who just go, ya boo rubbish. Intelligent questioners only. That, there's a woman who looks like a very intelligent woman. Can we get the microphone to her, please? Oh, despite the fact you're American. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm also Venezuelan, so. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to go back to the issue of social responsibility yes. of media. And uh, well, most of the media outlets here, although some, some are public, some are not. Um, in the most case, so, some may be appointed, the heads of the media, others, if they're private media or corporate media, are not, they're not elected by the people. So who, who then can control or have influence over when those media step out of hand and take on the role of political actors? On the panel, I just wanted to get opinions okay. on well, social, well, laws of, of social responsibility. Yeah. Got it. It's too big a panel. Um, we can't go to everybody. Oh, no. Can you, can you, can you, can you uh, I've nominated you to deal with the Thank issue. Who, who sort of polices, though you didn't use the word, the responsibility of the media, of the international media? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I believe the best regulation is the regulation of the viewer and the audience and not the regulation of the funder. In that context, I completely disagree with Anna who says it doesn't matter where the money comes from. If the money comes from a certain source, they're going to determine what you do. I believe for one that a good story knows no frontiers and eventually a good story can make a huge difference. To be able to pursue any good story, you need to be totally independent. So the short point in answer to your question is only and only private news outlets can provide balanced coverage. Government-backed, government-sponsored, government-funded news outlets may not be able to do so with the same efficacy that a private news broadcaster or digital provider will. And in the digital arena, we'll see the success of organizations like Vice. And they are the ones who are actually questioning you know, established news organizations. They are being accepted by younger demographies, younger audiences, even in their own countries. So I think, I don't know if that answers your question. My point is I think private news broadcasting but isn't is But isn't, no. isn't that in turn culturally specific? Can I because rebuttal you, on you that? come no. from a particular form of society. Just, just because democracy. you cite Vice, but for I mean, no, good, no story is any better than the journalists that report it, who bring to the table their own biases. I mean, we have BBC has a diversity of journalists, but many of them, for, I'll just cite the case of Venezuela, which I know really well and just had an election. Most international media, with the exception of some on the stage, particularly RT, uh, covered it in a way where they basically tried to discredit the electoral system, alleging there would be fraud. This was, this was what was portrayed on BBC. This was portrayed on CNN, on a lot of media worldwide. When the opposition won a majority of the legislature, all of a sudden the system was applauded because obviously the coverage was biased against the government because it's a government that's not necessarily favorable to Western interests. So, you know, in Venezuela and in, in other Latin American countries, there now exist laws of social responsibility in media yeah. where the state steps in with members of the community to regulate some of that yeah. media to make sure that they're not taking on the role of political yeah. actors to influence an agenda that's, yes. you know... Yes. You see, I broadly, though I'm not aware of the particular Venezuelan example that you're talking about, the danger would be between being prejudiced if you're funded by a government or someone versus being populist if you're a private news broadcaster. Both have their unique challenges. I think when you're talking about populism, a journalist can eventually balance populism versus his or her own idealism. But if you're being funded in a certain direction, you may not have the independence to do so. So Murdoch's not, um, he hasn't got an agenda, Rupert Murdoch. He's populist. <laughs> I can tell you, he he's influences right. elections I, I, a lot. I, I, I said, that was, that's why I said private news broadcasters yeah. have a tendency to be He's populist. still got an agenda, though. Yeah. Right. Listen, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm informed that there is someone from Vice in the audience. I was going to move on to Vice, the news channel, uh, and it would be lovely if the Vice person would make themselves known uh, so they can contribute to the conversation. Vice person? Uh, that's a shame. Uh, the new subsidiary of Disney or something. Sorry, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> Two hundred million dollars as of yesterday. I'm, I'm reliably informed. Uh, there's no one. That no, right. Sorry. The, the... Uh, this is a question. Yeah. All right. Question indeed. Microphone to. Oh. Um, I, I want to fo focus on the geopolitics, not of the media outlets, but of of governments and uh, big powers. Actually, Max and I have worked for Al Jazeera English when Ni Nigel Parsons was there, uh, BBC World News w under Paul Gibbs, and RT now. So what I want to ask is, when we first started working for Al Jazeera during their launch, um, we lost a lot of our guests for our first documentary after the Downing Street memos were released saying that the U.S. was going to bomb Al Jazeera. 
uh, most of our guests were afraid to appear on the show. And then once we uh, moved to RT, it was fine for many years, and then suddenly we're in a Cold War, and The Guardian and the BBC and Channel 4 News and everybody wants RT taken off the air in the UK. Could you move towards the question, please? The question is, what, what about that role in the geopolitics of what voices are allowed to be heard? Uh, Al Jazeera was going to be bombed by the US. RT uh, wants to be taken off the air by UK um, journalists <laughs> want to have the network taken off the air. So what role there? Uh, Mar Margarita, is there, is there a problem of threats when what you do sort of runs up to, into opposition from political centers and even sometimes in society? Well, there definitely are problems of threats and, and uh, the more influential you get, the, the more viewers you get, the more problems you get. Um, it's different in different countries. There are some countries in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, that openly say that they are not going to let us in any form or way to be present. And that is not only about us, RT, but also about our colleagues from um, um, Sputnik. You have the same. Um, in some other countries, like the United States, there are debates. I was told by um, a representative, I, I don't want to name even the organization, but anyway, from the States, that when uh, Russia was sanctioned, there was a huge debate in the States about whether or not RT should be put under sanctions to, or me personally. And uh, the debate, as I was told, was very heated. And one view was that let's use this uh, um, time when we can do something about them and shut them down. And the other view was, if you do that, uh, it will show the United States in a bad light, because what about freedom of speech, obviously? So thank God that other view prevailed, and we are still on air in the States, and we do not have such problems. In Britain, Ofcom has problems with us all the time. It also has problems to be uh, fair with other channels as well, including Fox News, for instance. But it doesn't have problems with the BBC. When they tell us that this part of our broadcast, in their view, was uh, not impartial enough, and we will show them parts of broadcast from the BBC that, in our view, were not impartial enough, because they, for instance, they tell us, this part of your broadcast did not give enough voice to NATO position, it gave too much voice to Libyan position. We would show them um, a piece from the BBC coverage that did not give enough voice to the Russian position. It would give too much we, voice. And, and, they, and they, uh, they are telling, we are being told that Ofcom does not regulate the BBC. This, that's well, it. To a considerable extent, that's, that's true. That's the response we get. Yeah, okay. There may be an over... Uh, the, the political plates are moving in the UK and Ofcom may, uh, be, may be regulating the BBC fully before too long. Uh, slight, the time is short. Uh, Luke, uh, can you address your mind to the threat, if that's not too emotional a word, the, the competition, the challenge that all of you really as television broadcasters face from the social media and the online media that is vice. But the social media, are, are, people, are people just, is there a danger maybe in five years' time, not now, that people will simply bypass you and create their own media online, Facebook, Twitter, fastest breaking news service in the world is Twitter. Uh, can you compete against all these things in the future? Uh, uh, Raymond, I would like to uh, come back to the earlier question. Um, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can, of course. The threat of, of the, yes. this political, political thing. I, I, I think I, I would echo that. Uh, the more influential the channel becomes, the more problems you probably come across, especially you, you uh, tackling those uh, sensitive political issues. But I think um, I would like to say that this is common practice. This is our job, and uh, we are facing certain kind of um, challenges and difficulties um, every day. Um, but I, I think this is kind of price uh, worth paying, and because um, by doing that, you you could just push forward, and you could let the world know that uh, um, the way that you do things 
in the future, probably in a short period of time, um, they, they couldn't, like Ofcom, Ofcom also have kind of uh, like issue with CCTV news uh, for a while. And, well, uh, I, I rarely yeah, wish to yeah. be fair to Ofcom in the UK, but uh, they, are, uh, they are set there by Parliament and by legislation. <laughs> they would argue they're just doing what Parliament yeah, has required right. them so to do. It's also, uh, to us, it's uh, kind of understandable, but uh, uh, what I want to say is this is kind of uh, our job, and this is okay. kind of a challenge, and the a daily work, we, we yes. are, daily situation, we are doing Good. this. So as we, as we head towards the end of the session, look in your crystal ball, the future. Yeah. Future competitors, future impact, the rise of the social media, and alternative news suppliers that are not broadcasters in the conventional sense. Yeah, I, I still think that uh, those digital media, we, we, we look at it in a different way. Uh, it's, it's kind of put a challenge, to put a pressure to, to the traditional media, but uh, um, why don't you think it's a good thing? It's a good way for you to just upgrade yourself and to think in another way and uh, um, to do the thing in a kind of more uh, fan, uh, trendy and uh, fashionable uh, Way so I, I still think that digital media is really put a lot of pressure and gave a lot of challenges to CCTV news now, to be honest. But uh, uh, come back to the very early stage, uh, I would like to say that uh, content. I still think content is a king. Probably this is a cliche now, but uh, I still that uh, a very good professional content and uh, journalistic content is still the pressure thing that. Uh, uh, traditional TV media organizations have. So I, I think this is our strength, this is, is our advantage. We make, should make full use of those strengths. And uh, the only way different thing, the only difference is we put it into a different kind of screen. We put it in a different way to let us audience to, to watch. So I think this is a good thing. Uh, let's face it. Okay. Nigel, um, in Africa, mobile phones and smartphones are spreading like wildfire, even in, in very poor and backward places. Is there a danger that people using these phones uh, will actually bypass you as a news organization in future? No, I think we're supplementary. Um, and, and <clears throat> it is, yeah, there are huge numbers of mobile phones. You said 100 million in India. There's 90 million in Nigeria. And Nigeria will soon have a bigger population than Russia. Um, people don't realize the kind of numbers involved. But I don't think, um, you know, in a place like Africa, yes, they've all got mobile phones, but you've still got this phenomenon um, where, you know, there'll be one or two TVs in a village and everyone will gather around and watch it. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, there's this huge hunger for news in, in emerging countries. Um, and that's still very much the case. And I don't think we're five or ten years away from mobile phones you know, getting rid of TV. So, I mean... TV was going to get rid of newspapers, radio was going to get rid of something, but you know, they, they, they all um, co-exist side and, by side. And, and do you fear the rise of uh, online players like Vice, apparently just picked up $200 million worth of new funding yesterday? I mean, these guys are going to be serious competitors, aren't they? I don't think it's that... I think they will, yeah. Sorry, carry on. I think the challenge uh, that we all face is, is sort of brand versus platform because of the plethora of organisations and plethora of media options there are is actually the chances are people are finding their news on their Facebook or their Google Plus or all these other ones. So they're not necessarily going to the Times Now app, the BBC app, the CCTV app. You know, you can't guarantee they'll go and they'll find, they can't guarantee that they'll continue to come to the news providers they've always gone to, that we need to go out and find them. And I think that's the challenge we all face. Arnav, if you could set hegemony aside for one <laughs> final uh, comment, uh, can we have your view of what you think the future yeah. of international news I'm is? I'm delighted I could sufficiently provoke you by talking about hegemony at the start. I know, it's a, wonder <laughs> it's a wonderful word, I'll never forget it. <laughs> no, I just think, you know, far from being threatened by digital, I'm delighted about it. Okay. Because, and for three reasons, my entry barriers come down which means quality journalists do not need lots of money and expensive distribution routes to reach people. What is happening with Vice is fascinating. It's just that television will move into video on demand, and video on demand will be available not on traditional TV, but on over-the-top networks. So the, it's not the medium does not change the message. The message essentially stays the same. We need to make sure that as these entry barriers come down, there is a proliferation of opinion on global issues, including the digital space that is coming from different parts of the world. And finally, Raymond, the point is,
countries like ours, China, other parts of the world which are growing, we have to acquire a global reach. I, and by that I mean expand our presence, our bureaus, our reporters around the world, so that there is a competition of opinion. When I spoke about hegemony opposed to others, I simply mean there needs to be a competition between your opinion and my opinion, and then the debate should ensue, not just one opinion. Thank you. And I think in, in all fairness, we should give the final word to our host from RT. Get out your crystal ball, look at the future, tell us how RT and indeed the whole world of international news will be in the next decade of your organization. You know, I frankly don't really get the essence of this whole discussion of digital versus TV, because what are we? Are we, are we a TV organization? Are we a digital organization? For instance, we have three billion views on YouTube. Does it make us a digital organization more than a TV organization? I personally, I just thought of that. I might have never read a newspaper in my entire life. Because by the time I was old enough to be interested in newspapers, we already had internet and I would read them online. I'm talking about a proper paper. And I recommend newspaper. That just occasionally you should do so. I don't understand. I don't understand why I should, because I read the same newspaper online, and it's much more convenient. I'll tell, I can, you, I'll I can... tell you. I'll tell you why you should. You're putting Sorry. hundreds of journalists out of work by not okay. paying for their work adequately. <laughs> That's the reason. But they write for the online version as well. It's Sorry, much seriously. Yeah, but future. seriously, it's much more convenient. I can make a copy. I can forward it to my colleagues. I can uh, cut something out and, and keep it somewhere on my notebook for future reference. Whatever. I don't understand what the paper is for other than put some smelly fish into it. But anyway. <laughs> I, have um, to, I have devoted my working life to your <laughs> smelly fish, damn it. <laughs> but um, anyway, about the future. I think that the only thing we can say about the future and have a small chance of that thing to actually happen in the future is that future is completely unpredictable in our sphere. Tomorrow, yet another 19-year-old boy comes up with yet another earth-shaking technology, something like virtual reality 360. The next day, Facebook will buy it for $2 billion. The next month, the whole world will be uh, obsessed by that technology and everyone will have to keep that in mind and change. I mean, all the, the, the media organizations. What happens in January? What happens in February? Who comes up with what? We do not know. Our job is to uh, be on alert, watch out, see what's going on, embrace it, and be one of the first to use it. That's, that's how I see it. Thank you very much. And now the most important announcement of all, it's lunchtime. And uh, but before you go, thanks to this wonderful panel. It's not Thank lunchtime. You. Oh, sorry, it's not lunchtime. Uh, my, my, my apologize. You're going to have to wait for lunch. There's one more session. We'll, we'll go off and leave you. <laughs> sorry Thank about you. that. <laughs> well done. Thank you, thank you all. Actually, we're staying here. We're not going anywhere because <laughs> we're having session four coming in just a couple of minutes, just a couple of moments. I would like to, to express our massive gratitude to all the speakers uh, right now. Thank you very much. And especially I would like